in this fourth century fragment of the book, written in the Coptic language, we have a new, previously unknown gospel. Eight lines on the front, six lines on the back. The most exciting line in the whole fragment, however, is the sentence, Jesus said to them, my wife. I mean, I never got very involved with that. I took one look at the photo and thought, this is rubbish. Like Hang very on. early on. Really? So, totally, totally, very early on. This is totally rubbish. But we're not reading translations of the originals of these books because we don't have the originals of these books or of any of the other books of the New Testament. What we have are copies made centuries later, many of them many, many centuries later. Eventually what ended up leading me away from the faith was an issue unrelated to my biblical scholarship. It had to do with how there can be so much pain and misery in the world. Let's talk about Bart Ehrman, uh, misquoting Jesus, the textual criticism website. 2005, it's still one of the most famous blogs you guys have done. Um, That's evangelical textual criticism. Yeah. So, what is it? Dot com. <laughs> I don't even know what a blog is. Okay. Um, search for that. It's a good blog. Yeah. Best ever Ashes final. Which year? That's lovely cricket. Well, uh, I don't know. Um, 2005 was good. That's where he's got a ball, and it was well taken as well. 2005. Because, in a sense, it was nice seeing the England actually win. The English were pretty bad. Um, they didn't use sandpaper, though. They didn't use sandpaper, that's true. But... Okay, talk me through the PhD at Cambridge. Um, <laughs> exciting, challenging. Yeah, uh, it, was ex it, was, it was certainly challenging. You know John Stott? I had an I interview. Know John Stott. I met him once. And Did I, you? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Where? I met him at a conference. 19? Yeah, I don't know. I can't remember. But I sat opposite him at breakfast, mm. and um, I, I've done this with other people. And he, he said, I said, oh, I'm Peter. He said, I'm John Stott. I said, oh, John, what do you do? <laughs> Did you say that? I did. <laughs> I did the same thing with John Piper at Tinder House. <laughs> what do you do? Cambridge Peter House. I played one game with you. Um, how many wickets? Was it four? You took four, four. I can't remember. Yes, I did. Yes, James Carlton's Badgers. James Carlton Badgers. Cricket team. No, that was that's always fun. <laughs> yes, a bit of, uh, you know, the medium pace trundler comes out. All right. Which works well in English conditions, the medium pace trundler. If you can just get a bit of right. movement in the air. Right. Yeah. Okay, you were born 1961. I was, at a young age. Mel was, very young age, very yes. Very young age. Melbourne. Melbourne. Right. You'll say it right, Melbourne. Melbourne. Right. No emphasis on the... Tell us the difference in culture between Melbourne and Sydney. Oh, Melbourne is a lovely town. <laughs> Sydney is that place up north. That um, place. Uh, difference in culture. Um, well, obviously, growing up, you don't really notice it much. I mean, uh, Melbourne was more uh, Australian rules football. Sydney was always more rugby. You played Australian football. Yeah, Australian rules football. That's the Melbourne thing, but it's now national all around the country. Uh, um, Sydney more glitzy, Melbourne more solid, uh, Sydney more American influenced, Melbourne more European influenced. Okay. Interesting. Um, and uh, Sydney obviously harbour, Melbourne has a river, so they have a big, a big advantage, spectacular views and things. Um, and uh, yeah, but like lots of weird rivalries, it's because you're uh, actually really close and small things separate you. Right. You went to university in Melbourne, you did maths and physics, and then something happened. You changed course. What happened? So, um, in my first year at university, I was doing maths and physics. I went to a Christian mission talk on what is the meaning of life. The Navigators. There was a guy from the Navigators giving a talk. 
and it was just the general Christian Union Mission Week, and um, it was the last thing on the Friday, and I had thought I, because I was a Christian, I should go to something in that week. I went to the very last thing, uh, only the very last talk, and um, somebody I knew was there, so I just hung around afterwards, and yeah, eventually the speaker came and asked me who I was and what was going on, and invited me to come to some Bible studies and mm -hmm. things, so I was very interested, so I said, I said yes, and through those Bible studies in the month after that, um, just a regular series of what we would see as a fairly basic evangelistic Bible study series on what is, who is Jesus and what did he do and what does the Bible say about ourselves as sinners and things like that So and, and, and what God has done in Christ through the cross. So, yeah, pretty basic stuff, but in one sense, also transformational. So, um, yeah, in the physics, it, Bible studies in the physics building at lunch times. And then you you switch over to theology. I went to Bible College Victoria. Yes. Right. I'll tell you a funny story. Mm -hmm. Do you want funny stories yeah. or do you want facts? Uh, facts. Okay. <laughs> it was a funny story. Now you won't hear it. <laughs> we can do that in part two. <laughs> Okay, let's fast forward. Um, 1986, you start a PhD on the Mona Hooker at Cambridge University. Correct. Right. October. Uh, before that, you went to Oak Hill. No, London Bible College. London Bible College. For an MA. MA. So I ended up doing a, B a BTH yeah. in Melbourne and then came overseas to London to a master's degree. Yeah. Okay, talk me through the PhD at Cambridge. Um, <laughs> exciting, challenging. Yeah, uh, it, was ex it was. It was certainly challenging. Um, uh, Take us through the. What was? What is challenging about a Cambridge PhD for an evangelical coming from Australia? Well, um, uh, so you got to remember, young people. <laughs> On the internet. Um, this is the days before the internet, yeah, so you couldn't like do research into a place and find out a lot about I didn't really know as much about Cambridge as probably you might today. I, mean, I knew it was a good good place and certainly my teachers at London Bible College had uh, people like Dick France and Max Turner, they'd recommended so think about Cambridge and um, so then getting in was a challenge, the timing of it was a challenge, getting the funding was a challenge uh, and um, that was exciting, I was 25 I think, you know, 24, 25 so a bit older, pretty young, you know, but you know, keen to, keen to do so and I, I, the topic I wanted to work on was something that I had had been raised for me by my earlier studies, mm. and I wanted to work on um, the Gospels, synoptic Gospels, relationships, interrelations, um, things like that, which had uh, been an issue of interest for me since I'd studied that in, in, in undergraduate days in college and mm. in my master's dissertation. So I wanted to tackle a subject mm. that was connected to my, yeah, I guess doctrine scripture, what is scripture, um, and figure things out for myself, not just, yeah, and I think Cambridge has always been good for that, get into the text for yourself, figure out things for yourself, you know, of course there are tracks in, in scholarship, but you don't need to follow them, you can, and yeah, my supervisor is good on just, you do what you want to do, that's absolutely fine. Um, yeah, and incredible privilege. I mean, and resource. I mean, there are unbelievable resources that, of course, you get used to them now. But you know, to somebody, you know, this Cambridge has I don't know seven million books in the university library. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. and you want to find a book from fifteen sixteen? Yeah, here it is. Mm. You want to, you know. Um, Ancient manuscripts, yeah, let's look at Codex Bizi and, you know, you know, 
Look at this passage. We'll get to textual Sorry. criticism now. How did you manage to work your way through critical scholarship, wrestling through issues and maintaining the faith during your PhD? In short. In short. Yeah. In short. Um, in short, you can't do it in short. So in a sense, you've got to do it every day in the details as well as in the big picture. I think that um, it's really helped in like just practical level things like at Tyndale House, chapel every week and at John Carson, Preacher Galatians, my first year. Really? And we had Bruce Winter, my mm. Peter, Corinthians. Um, in my second and third, you know, so really just getting into other parts of scripture uh, at, a, at a good level, you know. Um, I was active in my church, I led the youth group, I was, you know, preaching and stuff in church, so so I was... Which church was that? Holy Trinity. Right. In Cambridge. So, um, uh, so those were important. Uh, You've supervised a number of great friends of mine, Peter Malek, Peter Gurry, Barry Danilak, Will Timmons, Brian Pounds, and um, most of them produce superb PhDs. Um, what advice will you give to students who want to go to a secular university to do a PhD? What are the, let me ask it like this, what would be the greatest danger for conservative evangelicals to do a PhD at a secular university. The greatest danger, dangers, and what advice would you give them? Okay, so, um, firstly, I don't accept that Cambridge University is a secular university. No. So, no. When you graduate from the University of Cambridge, you graduate in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So they pronounce it Trinitarian form. Yeah. So it is some sort of of course, it's the history, but I'm not inclined to give up on that side of Cambridge University. Um, and of course, you can choose not to uh, have that, but you have to choose not to. to I think it's still the case. Interesting. Um, so I just, I'll just leave that as out there that um, we can give up on things that are secular when they're not. Than actually, um, so uh, okay. But of course, there's also expression. Um, no, and I've been very fortunate. I've a ton of really clever and good students that I've just let do their thing, and in lots of different areas, been privileged to yeah have a small part in encouraging them. Um, I just what I need advice? to come in there. I need to come in there and say I remember my time at Tyndale. What I always appreciated about Peter Head was his door was always, always open for students. Even if you're busy with a project, you will pause, put everything down, and spend quality time with your students. That's true. That's true. You did that. That's why I said I'm productive. But also, if they could get through the door to find a seat, <laughs> that was sometimes a problem. How many but cups did we remove <laughs> once in your office? How many? It was like more than 20. I drank a lot of coffee. It's true. And... Um, so what are the dangers, the so, dangers for a student, you know, doing a, a, a critical PhD? What are the dangers, pra practical advice you'll give to them? I think the danger, one danger is, in a sense, you, you believe what you're told and uh, don't do a thorough enough investigation and stop, stop before you've actually investigated things for yourself. Um, uh, so that, that I think is what I've always encouraged all my students to think for themselves and read everything and and ponder and question, you know, why this thing is there or you know why it's said in this sort of way or in, in whatever whatever subject. It's been very um, focused on that. Of course, those you know that covers a few historical Jesus and manuscript type things and method. All even. So, I mean, that, that was, um, uh, I think to build, I mean, I think the great thing about came in my era, and I guess still, you know, the Tyndall House, and there's a sort of community of yeah. people working in 
thing so that the problems you see in other places, even Oxford, and of sort of isolated students, where it is promoted them and their supervisor, yeah. uh, and then not, you know, surrounded by a supportive group of friends. Sure. Um, Talk to us about how do you manage to do incredibly detailed, sophisticated textual criticism. I mean, some of your footnotes, you know, you, it's difficult to follow them. How do you do that and at the same time read Romans or the Gospel of Mark with faith and without a critical lens? How do you do that that sustains your faith? And without thinking about all the nitty-gritty, you know, history of traditions of it, how do you, how do you manage that balance between them? Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I'm not like a technique-driven person, so I don't have, like, these are six rules I apply every day. Do you know what I mean? I don't really work like that. Um, I, do, I do think in God's good providence, I moved from four years of focus on this and my PhD days a job at Oak Hill in London where I was teaching Romans and so to the third year so that was pretty much a good breath of fresh air for me spiritually. Providential as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Teaching, God, teaching to theology to students. Form, I mean, um, so to take the skills of reading mm. and read and you know and all that and then apply them now to something which is not a historical issue but a the, you know, theological exegetical issue. Right? And 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 help students. But just the other day, um, I met a student who'd been on my very first course. I was now a bishop, in fact, and he said, not because he's a bishop, but he said he, he came up and said that he thanked me for that for that and what he'd learned about Rome to that course. And at Oak Hill. At Oak Hill. Amazing. In in, in, um, in fact, at the funeral of the beloved principal who was who was there when I was when he was done. And um, so. Uh, and as I said to him, it was, it was interesting because it was a voyage of discovery for me in which they also engaged them, the students. And, we, 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 and, and so that was very fresh, actually, for me. It wasn't teaching. So, um, and I, I do like, you know, I think one of the ways I do cope with that is to mix between research and teaching. Mm. So, in fact, even at the moment, I'm teaching Romans and, uh, you know, Galatians and Greek and stuff like that, uh, and yeah, doing some research and writing and, and things. So that it's um, you do a bit of both, oh. and I think a key skill for a Christian involved in academic work in the Bible is to be able to shift from you know big picture to little picture uh, in relatively seamless. So you can't you can't only be a you know details person in a, in a normal theological college or seminary, that just doesn't work. Um, it might be a bit in your research, um, but you're also going to be actually quite big students coming in having, in a sense, less and less background Bible knowledge. So you need, you need to tell big stories as well about covenant, you know, and, 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 and things like that that give shape to the whole Bible. Yeah, yeah. Um, so... Yeah. Right. Do yeah. Um, you've been at Cambridge for a while, and now you're at Oxford. Give us a little flavour of the different academic cultures that you have experienced at Cambridge and now at Oxford. Yeah. So obviously, at one level, that is pretty incredible, isn't it? To think of an Australian. And I think it's, yeah, it is quite incredible to think that you, I've had a, some sort of role, minor roles or whatever, in both places, with, with um, both in the faculty and in, I mean, I've obviously been in a sort of liminal space between the faculty, I think, in both, you know, so, but I mean, incredible, incredible privilege, you know, under God to, to have had that opportunity and to be in such, I mean, such beautiful places, such history. I, Cambridge I was, is more beautiful, there's no doubt about that. Yeah, I mean, that, 
And they're honestly, the history, you know, to, to um, you know, they were collecting books in their library before Captain Cook ever found Australia. Do you know what I mean? But, yeah. Not that there weren't already people there, uh, fine, but I mean, <laughs> in, in terms of the history of um, Australia. So, um, so... Intellectual differences between, or the culture, you don't have to make any judgment, just the cultural differences between Cambridge, scholarship, Oxford, the different traditions. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, I think one interesting feature has been that, uh, which is in a sense a minor point, but I think Cambridge's New Testament seminar has a sense of its own history. Uh, and uh, especially, of course, that's helped by the fact that more and more keeps going and the retired professors keep coming. And, you know, but, I mean, that, that, that has a kind of glory of its own history in a way that Oxford doesn't really have. Oxford professors can't afford to live in Oxford, so they'll move away or even back to Cambridge or... Think, back to Cambridge. Uh, yeah, yeah, they're just sort of, um, <laughs> uh, so that's curious. Um, uh, obviously, intellectually, um, Oxford has an interest in, well, a significant interest in reception history as a as a as something I think is interesting. Um, Cambridge is perhaps still a bit, although it's shifting as well. In Cambridge, sitting my time there, was still a bit. You know, our heroes are Lightfoot and Westcott and Hall and mm. sort of. Uh, Historical. Stanton. Stan, Stan. Well, yeah, but then echo through Charlie Mole. Yeah, Stan, no. You know, exegesis. Yeah, the text. The text still means, the texts mean things. Um, uh, and hence the languages and the text. Now, mm. not that that's not true in Oxford, but I think the emphasis on, in Oxford is on, you know, texts have impact and let's investigate that. Although you've got George Kidd there, Tom Wright worked with him. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, sure. Well, because in a sense, these are all pretty generalised. But it, I think you could say the interesting reception history has been, I guess it's, it's Roland's time. Yeah, Roland. Quite a dominant interest in Oxford and still. Yeah. Zickers and Mark Flott was very interested in that. Reception. Marcus Bachman is into reception too. Although, I mean, he's done work on the historical Jesus. Uh, that's one of my favourite historical Jesus books, actually, that he did um, in the 1990s. Yeah. yeah. This Jesus. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I appreciated that one quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it, yeah. No, it's good. He had a he had a footnote to Adolf Schlatter. Um, so you really like that? I absolutely did. <laughs> <laughs> if you have a footnote to Adolf Schlatter. You gave me a book on Adolf Schlatter last time. I did. Yeah. I did. yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, so they are two of the very good universities in this country. Sure. I studied at Durham. I, I studied at Durham and I somewhere up north, always have to say Oxford and Cambridge blocked Durham's application to become a university for centuries. And what did they say? They say, oh, we're going to, the quality of, uh, of scholarship will be reduced or something. Well, I and then I when I studied there, Durham was on top in 2008 and 9. I'll <coughs> never forget that. You pay no attention to those rules. <laughs> they make no sense and have no reasonable criteria. I mean, Michael Golder got under my skin when I, Mark Goodacre actually said I should get this book and read it. And I did. I wouldn't have bought it if he didn't tell me to get it. Um, and what I found intriguing was he went to Eton, and then it's a school in England. Eton is a school in England. <laughs> so for posh people, <laughs> right? In Australia, you went to a normal school. High school. High school. Campbell High School. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I want to read to you what happened with Michael Golder, one of the most controversial, original British scholars of the 20th century. There's no doubt about that. 
um, he finished Eton and then he went to do classics at Cambridge. He went to kick you. He was invited to go to kick you. And this is what he wrote. Christian Union. So I went to the sermon and it was indeed a shock. It was the first time that I had encountered Christianity as a religion of salvation. Very different from the pallid gospel of Eton. Um, what, what does that mean? Uh, he, w he went to kick you, and there he experienced Christianity as a, uh, a religion of salvation. He would say you were manipulated when you heard the gospel um, in Australia. What happens in some of these public schools? I mean, this is you know decades ago. What kind of Christianity is that compared to the kind of gospel preaching kick you kind of Christianity? Well, but also not only kick you, is it? It's like, what's the story of the New Testament about? Is it a story about salvation, redemption? Well, uh, yes. It, that, you know, so that is what. What is the New Testament centered? Centered on the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ as saving event. So, um, yes, there's an extent to which mainstream cultural English church life can find itself quite distant from Christianity's saving event, um, both historically, covenantally, and then individually applied. Um, but that, that, that seems like it's not a good testament. He went to kick you and he found a Christianity that actually centered in salvation. Well, that is a more... New Testament style of Christianity than the pallid Christianity of the Eden chapters in his day. Sure, it it, things have changed uh, there as well, obviously. Well, I, have no, I don't. I have no idea. I mean, who's the chap? Mm. I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? That that um, in all schools and colleges, you know, who, who the chaplain is will make a big difference to obviously what preached in chapel, taught in college. You wanted something more there, Ferdy, you're not, you're not, we want you to pick on the Church of England. The Church of England is a great and holy uh, work of God in this country. You've um, read this one? By Gerald, no. Is it good? Um, I've enjoyed it. I haven't read all of it. Um, here's maybe a quote. Start with St. Albans. <laughs> Where did he start? Uh, yeah. Christianly begin. Yeah, sort of. St. Alban? That's the thing about the country. You have Christians. <laughs> you know, martyrs back in the you know, 200, early 200s, like Alban. Albanus. Yeah, yeah. yeah. St. Alban's is named. And in a sense, the history goes so far back. And let alone the Roman Christian mosaics, yeah. Christian Cairo symbols. And, sure. Uh, let's do one quote from Gerald here, page 616. Uh, you, you can respond if you want to. 616, that's an interesting number, team. <laughs> uh, if the mainstream Protestant churches were in serious decline, the free church tradition was reinvigorated by an entirely new source. One of the most remarkable features of modern British Christianity has been the explosion of independent churches, almost all of which are evangelical. The Fellowship of Independent Evangelical Churches, the FIEC, now has more than 600 congregations and about 40,000 people connected to it. And so far at least, yeah, yeah. And so far at least seems to be resisting the overall pattern of decline. Do you have, um, do you um, understand why they are British Christians who are joining these FIEC churches. Presumably they're becoming Christians and joining their local congregation. <laughs> why, why, sure, why are there more and more mainline uh, churches where evangelicals are moving towards FIEC churches? Oh, well, that wasn't the data supplied there. You're, you're junior. Yeah, yeah. I mean... Uh, obviously, within the Church of England mm. as a whole, mm. 
uh, the Church of England is not as fully reformed and Protestant evangelical as we would wish yet. So uh, debates continue in the National Church as to its future direction on all sorts of matters, including complex issues of human sexuality uh, and things like that, where um, the authority of the Bible is not um, universally accepted, um, despite the inheritance we have, you know, from from Cranmer and, and the Thurnan articles and things. So, um, of course, in your local area, if all you've got is a liberal Catholic kind of Anglican church, mm -hmm. you'll go to the local evangelical church. Um, and equally, if in your area you've got a lively evangelical Church of England church and some climbing Baptist church, you might well come. I mean, I, 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 I'm not a statistician. I can't generalize. Sure. Um, certainly people I know have got a bit fed up with the Church of England and it's dithering on a load of issues. You've got friends in the Anglican Mission in England? Anglican Mission in England. I know people in a few of these places. I'm not always quite sure which, which denomination mm -hmm. they get. My daughter goes to a church in, up north somewhere. Mm -hmm. It's Anglican, but not Church of England. Could be the Anglican Mission, probably. Probably it is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that, that obviously the complex issues are oversight with some of these churches. Mm. Um, you've had various, even with churches in Durham, which had oversight from South Africa. Yes, I and, heard about that. Uh, reach, what, reach in Southern Africa. Can you exert from yeah. a different continent? Uh, that's mm. a to me that's a pretty weird type of Anglicanism. Yeah, it's almost as weird as our normal type of Anglicanism. But um, you know, John Stott had it in an interview. John Stott, I met him once. And I Did said, you? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Where? I met him at a conference. Nineteen. Yeah, I don't know. I can't remember. But I sat opposite him at breakfast, mm. and um, I'd, I've done this with other people. And he he said, "I said, oh, I'm Peter. Said, I'm John Stott." I said, "Oh, John, what do you do?" <laughs> did you say that? I did. <laughs> I did the same thing with John Piper at the House. <laughs> and he, and, uh, I thought, what do you do? And then eventually, John Piper said, and he had this conversation with John Stott about what he did, which is interesting to hear how he, how he presented himself. Um, but of course, I was just laughing because I didn't know who he was. Uh, My point of, um, about him is you know that he, he had red lines, and in uh, 1995, they had an interview with him saying, what will it take for you to leave the Church of England? Do you know about that? What would it take? He said if they're going to have an alternative for biblical marriage, yes. as an alternative, he would fight for a while, but that, then if they persist, he will have to, to leave. There are many evangelicals who don't want to, to acknowledge that, but Stott actually said that. Okay. Well, they're going to fight for the truth, and then if he doesn't win, he's going to leave. Yeah, and so of course that goes... To fight for the truth. I mean, mm. everybody wants to fight for the truth where they are. Sure. In the calm, peaceful way, because it's England. Respectful, <laughs> of course, of course. So, um, yeah, that was interesting. I mean, he had a long-standing disagreement with you, you know, Martin Lloyd-Jones, about do you fight sure. on the inside? Sure. Do you try to reform? Do you move out? And we won't resolve that in this interview, <laughs> obviously not. But but you can envision a situation where, I mean, we lived in Cambridge for several years. There are local evangelical churches where some of those parish pastors, vicars, told me that, you know, if things get much worse, they will have to, at some point, realign. Um, yeah. You go to Christ Church, which is a very well-known evangelical church in, in Cambridge. Expository preaching, very good, long history. Let's ask one question. Tell us a bit, just a bit before we finish about the Calvinistic reformed tradition within the Church of England, because that's fairly unknown to, to people outside. People with beards, you mean. <laughs> people who read John Calvin, but they are Anglican in England. Well, all Anglicans will read John Calvin, 
You might ask me, uh, John Calvin, when we did the authority of script chat, and I'll remember. Who wouldn't want to read with John Calvin? All right. I mean, uh, do you mean um, Presbyterians in the church? Because that's the, obviously one distinction feature is, you know, in a sense, we agree with Presbyterians on the Baptist, but we disagree on church. Governance and Governance structure. and polity and, you know, we have a structure with bishops and, um, and things like that, which is kind of integral in one sense to the church ring. In another sense, somebody's going to do the admin um, <laughs> in, in the church. So... I think it's. A, I think it's. I come from a Calvinist Presbyterian background. I think it's a stalemate when it comes to which governing structure is better at preserving sure. the gospel. I think it's a stalemate because you've got the synodical s system that's manipulated. You have the bishop system that's manipulated. Yeah. I don't know whether any one of them yeah. is better at preserving. You get the same problems in both. So, what's the governing structure of the church in Corinth in Paul's day? Yeah, that's a good question.